When I look back on my childhood, or I remember some words from Spanish or from Russian, здравствуйте, or I bring to mind one of Maxwell's equations, I'm drawing on portions of my brain involved in long-term memory. But when I'm trying to hold a few ideas in mind to connect them together so I can understand a concept or solve a problem, I'm using my working memory. Obviously, sometimes I'll bring something from my long-term memory into my working memory so I can think about it. So the two types of memory are related. There are lots of different ways to slice our understanding of memory, but for this course on learning, we're going to talk about only these two major memory systems, working memory and long-term memory. Working memory is the part of memory that has to do with what you're immediately and consciously processing in your mind. Your working memory is centered out of the prefrontal cortex, although, as we'll see later, there are also connections to other parts of your brain so you can access long-term memories. Researchers used to think that our working memory could hold around seven items, or chunks, but now it's widely believed that the working memory holds only about four chunks of information. We tend to automatically group memory items into chunks, so it seems our working memory is bigger than it actually is. Although your working memory is like a blackboard, it's not a very good blackboard. You often need to keep repeating what you're trying to work with so it stays in your working memory. For example, you'll sometimes repeat a phone number to yourself until you have a chance to write it down. Repetitions needed so that your metabolic vampires, that is, natural dissipating processes, don't suck those memories away. You may find yourself shutting your eyes to keep any other items from intruding into the limited slots of your working memory as you concentrate. So we know that short-term memory is something like an inefficient mental blackboard. The other form of memory long-term memory is like a storage warehouse. And just like a warehouse, it's distributed over a big area. Different kinds of long-term memories are stored in different regions of the brain. Research has shown that when you first try to put an item of information in long-term memory, you need to revisit it at least a few times to increase the chances that you'll be able to find it later when you might need it. The long-term memory storage warehouse is immense. It's got room for billions of items. In fact, there can be so many items they can bury each other, so it can be difficult for you to find the information you need unless you practice and repeat at least a few times. Long-term memory is important because it's where you store fundamental concepts and techniques that are often involved in whatever you're learning about. When you encounter something new, you often use your working memory to handle it. If you want to move that information into your long-term memory, it often takes time and practice. To help with this process, use a technique called spaced repetition. This technique involves repeating what you're trying to retain, but what you want to do is space this repetition out. Repeating a new vocabulary word or a problem-solving technique, for example, over a number of days. Extending your practice over several days does make a difference. Research has shown that if you try to glue things into your memory by repeating something 20 times in one evening, for example, it won't stick nearly as well as if you practice it the same number of times over several days. This is like building the brick wall we saw earlier. If you don't leave time for the mortar to dry, that is, time for the synoptic connections to form and strengthen, you won't have a very good structure. And talk about lasting structure. Look at this part of the Acropolis here. Thanks for learning about learning. I'm Barbara Oakley.
on that if you try to glue things into your memory, for example, it won't oh time for the mortar to dry. That is, time for the synoptic connections to form and strengthen. You won't have a very good structure. And talk about lack. You might be surprised to learn that just plain being awake creates toxic products in your brain. How does the brain get rid of these poisons? Turns out that when you sleep, your brain cells shrink. This causes an increase in the space between your brain cells. It's like unblocking a stream. Fluid can flow past these cells and wash the toxins out. So sleep, which can sometimes seem like such a waste of time, is actually your brain's way of keeping itself clean and healthy. So let's get right to a critical idea. Taking a test without getting enough sleep means you're operating with a brain that's got little metabolic toxins floating around in it, poisons that make it so you can't think very clearly. It's kind of like trying to drive a car that's got sugar in its gas tank doesn't work too well. In fact, getting too little sleep doesn't just make you do worse on tests. Too little sleep over too long of a time can also be associated with all sorts of nasty conditions, including headaches, depression, heart disease, diabetes, and just plain dying earlier. But sleep does more than just allow your brain to wash away toxins. It's actually an important part of the memory and learning process. It seems that during sleep, your brain tidies up ideas and concepts you're thinking about and learning. It erases the less important parts of memories and simultaneously strengthens areas that you need or want to remember. During sleep, your brain also rehearses some of the tougher parts of whatever you're trying to learn, going over and over neural patterns to deepen and strengthen them. Sleep has also been shown to make a remarkable difference in your ability to figure out difficult problems and to understand what you're trying to learn. It's as if the complete deactivation of the conscious you in the prefrontal cortex at the forefront of your brain helps other areas of your brain start talking more easily to one another, allowing them to put together the neural solution to your learning task while you're sleeping. Of course, you must also plant the seed for your diffuse mode by first doing focused mode work. If you're going over what you're learning right before you take a nap or going to sleep for the evening, you have an increased chance of dreaming about it. If you go even further and set it in mind that you want to dream about the material, it seems to improve your chances of dreaming about it still further. Dreaming about what you're studying can substantially enhance your ability to understand. It somehow consolidates your memories into easier to grasp chunks. And now, time for a little sleep.
also be associated with all sorts of... So let's allow your brain to wash away. It strengthens areas that you need or want to remember. During sleep, your brain also rehearses some of the tougher parts of whatever you're trying to learn, going over and over neural patterns and to understand what you're trying to learn. It's as if the complete de more easily to one another, allowing them to put together the neural solution to your learning task while you're sleeping. Of course, you must also plant the seed for your diffuse mode by first doing focused mode work. If you're going over what you're learning right before you take a nap or going to sleep for the evening, you have an increased chance of dreaming about it. If you go even further and set it in mind that you want to dream This video will be especially fun because I have a chance now to interview my co-instructor, Dr. Terence Sainowski. Terry's pioneering research in neural networks and computational neuroscience have made him a living legend. Dr. Sainowski is an investigator at Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the Francis Crick Professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, where he directs the Computational Neurobiology Laboratory. Above and beyond all of that, Dr. Sinowski is also in the elite group of only 10 living scientists to have been elected to all three of the national academies in engineering, science, and medicine. What I think is perhaps most impressive, however, is that Terry has also graduated more computational neuroscientists than any other scientist. In some sense, then, this makes Dr. Terence Sainowski a leading father figure for the modern field of neuroscience. The ultimate goal of Dr. Sainowski's research is to build linking principles from brain to behavior using computational models. Today, I'm going to ask Terry a few questions about how he learns and how he thinks about learning so that we might all get a better sense of how to improve our own learning. So what do you do to help yourself learn more easily when you're looking at something completely new? Well, I like to get into the thick of it. I don't get much out of just going and reading a lot of books. And when I was in graduate school, I made a transition from physics to biology. And the way I did it was to get into a biology lab and get involved in experiments. And I, I'm a firm believer in learning by doing and learning by osmosis from people who are experts. How do you keep yourself paying attention during something like a boring lecture? I found th that there isn't a simple way to keep yourself attending something that you're not interested in. But I have found a little trick to waylay the, the speaker, and that is by asking a question. And the interruption often gives rise to a, a discussion that is a lot more interesting. And it actually uh, follows the general principle, which is that you learn a lot more by active engagement rather than passive listening. So what do you do to get into and take advantage of diffuse mode thinking? I find that when I'm jogging or out getting exercise, that it's a wonderful way to get the mind disengaged from the normal train of thought. And I find that it's very, very possible to, to, to sort of come up with new thoughts, new ideas. And it's almost as if your brain goes into a new mode. You're running along. Things are passing you by. And you start thinking about what's happening. For example, the things that, that your brain has been working on, your unconscious thoughts bubble to the surface and, and often uh, new ideas that uh, are, are going to be then helpful to you later on. The only problem I have is remembering all those great ideas because when I get back and take a shower then a lot of them have evaporated and that's why I, I like to take a little notebook along with me so I can take notes and uh, remember what it is that uh, I was thinking about. So do you multitask, or, or if you don't, how do you resist the urge to multitask when you want to multitask? Well, I wouldn't survive if I couldn't multitask, and most of my day is spent 
talking with students, listening to lectures, interacting with a lot of people who are passing through, visitors. There's just a lot of things that are bombarding you, email, texting. And, and you know, th these are very important things that you want to do, but if you can't juggle, then it's hard to get through the day. However, I, I enjoy the evenings when the hubbub of the day quiets down and I get a chance to go into a more reflective mode, and that's when I actually get my best work done. Do you do, you, do, you do two things at the same time ever? Well, you know, you can't actually do two things consciously at the same time because those will get mixed up. It, it is possible with a lot of training, actually, to do two things at once, but it's, it's, you're not doing it efficiently. For me, multitasking is, is being able to switch back and forth, context switching from one topic to another. And some people are better at that than others. In other words, uh, sometimes it takes a while to get into the swing of things. If you're in the middle of writing a paper, for example, it may take hours before you get to the point where you can actually be productive and you're actually able to get something accomplished. But if, if, if you can, you know, after getting... Uh, lay, you know, uh, uh, into middle of something, uh, switching from that to another task is, is sometimes very difficult to do if, if you're if, if you're middle of something. But I can do that very easily. I can switch back and forth, and I seem to be able to go back to the original task and 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 uh, take up where I left off. So uh, so that's one way of of accomplishing a lot. And I get uh, I have fortunately I have a lot of very good students and uh, helpers and enormously productive environment that I, I'm working in. So it's, it's been, it's, it's really a joy to be here. So do you, how do you apply so your knowledge of neuroscience to your own learning? Well, you know, I, I think there are many little ways that I have applied what I've actually learned in the lab. And let me give you just one example to make it concrete. One of my colleagues here at the Salk Institute, Rusty Gage, made a very important discovery. If you read the textbooks, it'll tell you that all the neurons that you have in your brain, you had at birth. And after birth, the wiring takes place, and learning and changes at the, the connections between the neurons. But they're, they're the same old neurons that you had when you were born. Some die, uh, so you know, there is a shrinkage of your, of your cortex. However, Rusty discovered that in an important part of your brain for learning and memory, the hippocampus, which is located right in the middle here of this model brain, new neurons are being born even in your adulthood. And since this is very important for learning and memory, it is obviously something that is very, very useful to be able to have new neurons. Now, here's what we discovered together. We discovered that if you have a animal, we use a, a rat as our model system, and if you give it an enriched environment in which the rat is able to move around and do things and interact with other rats, that, and then look in the hippocampus, you find that the, the, the strengths of the connections between the neurons is much stronger there. It, it can be made by a factor of two much stronger than in a rat that has been kept in a cage where there is impoverished environment. Now, and here's now the, the, the key, okay? So having a rich environment is, 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 even as an adult, is going to help you, right? Instead of locking yourself in a, a monk in the room, uh, you really want to be surrounded by uh, other people who are stimulating you and events that are happening that you can actively participate in. So, so that's important. But now here is something Rusty discovered, which I think is incredibly important, that in the absence of a nourishing environment, exercise will also increase the number of new neurons that are being born and survive. And so I am very avid at running. I've already mentioned that I get lots of good ideas when I run, but I also know that my brain is helping me remember things because of the fact that I have new neurons being born and surviving in my hippocampus. So that's one of many examples that I can point to in which what we've learned about neuroscientists from neuroscience has really 
changed the way I think. And it's a pity if you look at the way our, our new educational reforms in, in schools, what did they cut out when they want to add a new se a session on, for example, learning something, for example, how to pass a test, right? Tests are being given now to help assess how well a student is doing and how well a school is doing. Well, it's recess. And what happens during recess? Exercise. It's running around. It's exactly what you need, what your brain needs. It needs that moment of pause, of, of, of using your muscles rather than your brain to be able to process that information and, to, and, and get the neurons working on it. So I think that this is, again, something that is, should be a policy that we need to have our children out there running around. Have there been any special techniques you've acquired over the years that help you focus, learn, or create more effectively? I find that being in a, a creative environment where other people are, are creative is, is, is a way of enhancing your own creativity. I think that Although the image we have of the creative thinker as being isolated genius it may be true of some people, it's not true of me. I really find that I have better ideas if I'm talking to somebody and trying to explain to them my ideas. Often that process can it boost that creative process. And in fact, I think that you know, having other people around to bounce your ideas off of is really, for me, a very, very important part of doing science. How about test taking? Any special advice there? Tests are like any other skill. You can learn them. Uh, you can learn to be a better test taker, and you have a lot of good ideas about that. Uh, I I've discovered that, um, uh, that, that the, what you need, things to avoid, for example, don't get hung up. If you can't answer a question, go on to the next, because uh, you can always come back. And in fact, often the, I, the answer to the problem that was holding you back may actually pop into your brain later on in the test. This is how our brains work. It's, it's, the, things work along parallel tracks. How do you approach your creative work in science? How do you keep yourself creative in the face of the onslaught of more routine day-by-day -day tasks? I've been very fortunate because I have a great lab and my students and colleagues keep me young in terms of learning new things, looking at things with new perspectives. So I think that having youth around really is a, a great way to keep yourself youthful. If you had any advice for a young high school or college student about how to learn effectively, what would you say? That success isn't necessarily come by being smart. I know a lot of smart people who are not successful. But I know a lot of people who are very, very passionate and persistent. A lot of success in life is that passion and persistence of really staying the course, staying, working on it, and not letting go, not giving up. That's really, I think, the most important quality that I see in students that I work with who are successful. Terry, I cannot thank you enough for your great answers that I think people will find very helpful. Wonderful. Now, I want to just give a little intro here. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Francis Crick's brain. So I first met Francis 30 years ago, and this brain was sitting in his office. And Francis was a close colleague. Of, I moved here about 25 years ago and got to know Francis much, much better. And one day, we were chatting, and Francis pointed out this brain that had been sitting there for decades 
and said, Terry, do you know that I just recently realized that this brain is actually much bigger than a real brain? And in fact, you could not fit this brain in my skull if you actually look at the relative sizes. It's, this is a teaching tool for medical students. You, know, you can take apart the different parts of the brain. But uh, isn't it interesting that Francis Crick didn't realize that until much, much later when he actually looked at it with new eyes. And so, you know, this is something about learning with fresh new eyes. Isn't it extraordinary? Even a, a Nobel Prize winning discoverer of DNA. Could... Well, there are things to discover every day about <laughs> things around us, ordinary things that you just have to look at them with a different set of eyes, a different uh, perspective.